Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, I am Rick Caulfield, provost here at the Uni University of Alaska Southeast. And welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming out. What a spectacular day we had here in Juneau. Uh, so it's just a, a terrific opportunity to come inside and, and learn from our guest presenters tonight. Uh, the presentation is about monitoring the Mendenhall outburst flood, and I'll say a, a bit more about our presenters here in just a moment. But before I do, I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the next evening at Egan session, next Friday here in the Egan Lecture Hall. And it's a presentation that's entitled Israel, the Occupied Territories and Nonviolent Resistance. And the presenter is Skip Scheel, who is a photographer with Juno Connections. Um, the description about his work includes uh, Skip Scheel has been documenting the Palestinian and Israeli reality through photographs and journal postings since 2003. He works with a better feel for the detailed texture of life in Gaza and the West Bank than any appearing in US media. Scheel spends times where most journalists dare not tread amidst ordinary Palestinians sharing in the dangers and frustrations of their lives. So I think uh, a very timely presentation and one that should be very, very interesting, very stimulating for us all. So that is uh, next Friday, September 28th here in the Egan Lecture Hall. So for our presentation tonight, um, we'll have the presentation and then there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers uh, following uh, the talk. Um, we will ask, if you don't mind, um, that you use a microphone because we are recording this and it'll be available in other venues. So if you don't mind, if you can wait to uh, use the microphone uh, for questions and answers. And Rochelle here has agreed to uh, bring that mic around when you have that, uh, we have the opportunity for Q&A. So it's a, a great privilege for me as provost to introduce our two guest presenters tonight. One of the things uh, people ask me, well, what do I get to do as a provost? And the thing I like to say the most, and it's true because I believe it, is I get to be involved with hiring really great people and working with really great people. And that includes the two faculty members that we have here tonight who are making this presentation. The first is Dr. Aaron Hood, who many of you know. He's an associate professor of environmental science. He also has a joint appointment with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He joined our faculty in 2002. He's the current chair of our natural sciences department and he received the UAS Faculty Award for Excellence in Research just this past year in 2011. He earned his PhD in Geography in 2002 from the University of Colorado at Boulder. His MA degree in Geography also at uh, CU in Boulder in 1998 and his uh, Bachelor's degree in Biology from Harvard University in 1991. His research interests include watershed scale biogeochemistry, nutrient cycling and aquatic systems, alpine and glacial hydrology, snow hydrology, and snow chemistry. And obviously, you'll be hearing about some of those themes here uh, tonight. One of the things I just want to underscore, uh, not only is he an outstanding scientist, but uh, he is someone that students repeatedly tell me uh, does an outstanding job of making complex subjects easy to understand. He's well-liked and respected. They talk about his. Um, engaging way of working in a lab environment and creating an organized learning environment where they understand what they need to accomplish to be successful and, and really helps us uh, achieve our goal of student success here at UAS. So it's a privilege to uh, have Aaron be a part of the presentation tonight. And he's also joined by uh, Dr. Jason Amundsen. And uh, I'm especially pleased Jason uh, came to UAS, um, was it just last year? Just last year, it seems like longer, but um, uh, he was one of a number of faculty members that we were lucky enough to hire uh, who are just outstanding, really do a phenomenal job, and are very much focused on, again, teaching uh, and student success. So Jason is an assistant professor of geophysics. He joined the faculty, as I said, in 2011. He was a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Chicago Department of Geophysical Science in 2010 and 2011. He earned his PhD in geophysics uh, at University of Alaska Fairbanks. His thesis was iceberg calving dynamics in Jakobshavn Eastbray in Iceland, uh, Greenland, where I also got to spend a little bit of time. That's Sermersawak in Greenlandic. He earned his Master of Science in Geophysics also at UAF 
and his Bachelor of Science in Geology and uh, Geological Engineering at the University of Minnesota. His research interests are iceberg calving, outlet glacier dynamics, uh, glacier seismology, and subglacial processes. So it's a real privilege for me to introduce Dr. Aaron Hood and Dr. Jason Amundsen. Well, thanks, Rick, um, for that introduction. I feel like I better say something intelligent after that, and also, I guess, makes sense in my classes. I see some of my students here. Um, well, thanks, everyone, for coming. I think um, what we're going to do tonight is kind of split this in half. I'm going to give the first half of the talk, and Jason's going to give the second half. And so I'm going to start out by giving you a little bit of background and hopefully helping you to understand kind of what's going on with the phenomenon of the glacier outburst flood. And then Jason's gonna talk a little bit about some of the monitoring efforts that we have uh, going on at Mendenhall. Okay, so what are, um, is there any way we could turn? Yeah, there we go, perfect. Um, so what are glacier outburst floods? Well, basically what we're talking about is water that can be stored on the surface of the glacier, along the side of the glacier, or beneath the glacier that is released in some kind of episodic, abrupt fashion. And it's a pretty common hazard in high latitude areas, um, high elevation areas. So if you go to places like Nepal, Alaska, Iceland, Chile, these kind of glacier outburst floods are pretty common occurrences. And for us here in Juneau, it wasn't really a common occurrence. We have some in the region. There's one that I'll talk about that occurs regularly on the Taku River. Every year, there's also been a number of outburst floods up near Skagway on the Taya River. And so it's something that's been happening in this region, but not as much locally until we've had this Mendenhall outburst flood for the last uh, two years. Okay, and so there's another term that everyone's been throwing out here, which is yokelop. It's how I pronounce it. I'm sure that's not exactly how someone from Iceland would pronounce it. But basically, this term was, according to Jason, is, it means jumping glacier, but basically, the idea is that in Iceland, where this coin was termed, they have this ice cap that has both volcanic ac activity subglacially and also uh, geothermal activity subglacially. And so the melting that's associated with the geothermal heat or with the subglacial volcanic eruptions uh, leads to these abrupt outburst floods that they have uh, in Iceland. And so that's kind of where the term came from. That's the last time I'm going to use it. I like to use the term outburst flood because it's a lot easier to pronounce. OK, so what kinds of outburst floods do we have? And I'm going to uh, try to use the mouse here. So there's a couple different types. This is a nice example. So one way we can get an outburst flood, if this is the main glacier coming down here, where we have a side glacier that's receded back and left a gap, we essentially have what's oftentimes sort of an over-deepened basin with a dam, which would be the main glacier there. And this is kind of the case that we have here in Juneau. And so we have water coming down into this. It's blocked by the main glacier. That can cause uh, essentially a basin to fill up, and then that can be released episodically. There's some other uh, ways that you can have outburst floods. Here's another one down here, which is there's a glacial moraine. So you can see all this sediment which is built up a place where the terminus held its position over time, it essentially dumped a lot of sediment there, created this dam, you get lake water building up around it. Eventually this will fail, and so you can have an outburst flood uh, resulting from that. You can get outburst floods when glaciers are advancing and also when glaciers are retreating, which is what's going on here at Mendenhall. Okay, other outburst floods in the area. So here's Tulsaquah Glacier, which drains into Taku River. And some of you may be familiar with this. It's very common in July when you get this, you'll hear it on the NOAA weather radio, and they'll say there's a flood warning for the Taku River associated with the outburst floods here. There's a couple of lakes. This one, A, is called Lake No Lake. And then these are upper Tulsaquah, middle, uh, lower and upper and middle Tulsaquah lakes along here. And so there are outburst floods associated with these lakes. I'll show you a couple pictures. So here's Lake No Lake, and essentially it's the same idea where there was a side glacier coming in here to the main Tulsaquah Glacier. That side glacier is receded back, leaving this basin that's pretty well constrained. And so that fills up with water from melt water from both the mountainsides around it and from the glacier that's receded back. But the release of water is dammed off 
uh, here by the glacier, and so it's not going to release from that lake until you build up enough water pressure in the lake, and then once that starts, you get this abrupt release of water that goes down the Tulsaquah Glacier and into the Taku River. Okay, and here's another shot of uh, the lower Tulsaqua Lake after it's drained out. So you can see all these icebergs that were floating. You can see this kind of bathtub ring here, and essentially all that water has drained out, and usually over the period of a day or two, drains out under the glacier, and so you get this epi episodic increase uh, in discharge associated with that. All right, so if we look more generally at kind of regional trends right now, one of the strong trends in terms of glaciers and ice fields in this region is very pronounced thinning in, and volume loss associated with the glaciers, okay? So 95% of glaciers in Southeast Alaska are thinning and retreating. This map right here is a map of ice thickness rate of change. And so what it's showing you is in meters per year, the rate at which glaciers are thinning. And so this is the Juneau Ice Field. Here's Mendenhall coming down. There's Taku. Taku is actually this, the period covered by this map is 1950s to 2000. It was actually made using data from the space shuttle by Chris Larson at UAF. And so Taku during that time period was actually thickening. But most of the glaciers in the reds and yellows, that means they're thinning and they're retreating. And so that's kind of the context for the outburst flood we have here. If you go out to Mendenhall, there's very clear evidence of this ice thinning, and we can see rates of thinning, you know, four, six, eight meters a year down here at the lower elevations near the terminus, and it's evident from what are called trim lines here. So you see these areas along the side of the glacier where the vegetation is gone, and that's evidence of area that's basically been recently exposed and the forest is encroaching down from above and revegetating these areas as they become exposed. And so in the context of Mendenhall, this is important because part of what we think might be happening, so here's a, here's a shot of Suicide Basin. So here's the terminus down in Mendenhall Lake. If you go up the terminus, it's kind of the first major basin on the east side. This glacier up here used to come down the suicide falls and connect directly into the main Mendenhall Glacier there. In the last decade, it's receded back up out of the basin and it's actually perched, it's sort of a hanging glacier up on the cliff here. And so there's two things going on that are important. One is that the glacier ice in this basin is not being fed from the glacier anymore and so it's essentially wasting away over time and so it's thinning. As the glacier ice in this basin thins, what that means is that the basin itself can hold more water. At the same time, the main glacier here, which is our dam, is thinning, okay? And so one uh, possible explanation for why we started having these outburst floods all of a sudden is we basically got a balance where we're getting the ability to hold more and more water in the basin, and the dam that's holding it in is thinning, and so that it's essentially easier for that dam to become buoyant because functionally what happens is that the water pressure in the basin builds up to the point where it can actually lift the glacier up. It starts draining under the glacier. At first the drainage is very slow and then it becomes channelized and as it channelizes the frictional heating actually widens out the drainage channel and so it starts draining very quickly. So at the end of the drainage, and Jason will show some data later that illustrates this pretty well, it starts off draining very slowly and then the drainage rate increases dramatically. And so a, you know, a possible explanation for why this started happening now is that we have this combination of thinning of the main glacier and the ability of the basin itself to hold more water. Okay, so you know a couple other things about the hydrology, and these are just shots, and I'll show a few kind of review slides from last year, the 2011, the bigger outburst flood. Um, but one of the important things from a hydrological standpoint is that the glacier itself is dumping water into the lake here, and so we have a storage associated with the lake. The stream gauge that we use to monitor the Mendenhall is essentially dependent on the change in lake level, and so 
it's not directly connected to the outburst flood in the sense that if we took the lake out and the river just came right out of the glacier, we'd have a much better connection and sort of knowledge of when the flood started than having this reservoir in the middle, which delays the transit time. And so then you can see here's, you know, back loop road on the bridge, and that's when people were coming out during the outburst flood last year and looking. I, know, I don't think Tom Matisse from the city is here. He kept saying, don't go on the bridge, don't go on the bridge during the flood. So anyway, don't go on the bridge during the flood, but it was pretty cool if you did go out there. Um, <laughs> At any rate, so we have this kind of connected glacier, lake, river system here, and so that's what we're in the, you know, that's what we've been trying to monitor, but we're now trying to kind of carry the monitoring from the river, which the USGS is monitoring, there's a stream gauge there, and take the monitoring up onto the glacier to give us kind of a better early warning system. Okay, so I'm going to go back, as I said, to 2011 here, and some of you may have be familiar with some of these slides. So this is a shot that was taken when the basin was actually full, and so you can see that this ice, so this is this sort of stagnant ice that's remaining in the basin. The glacier itself has retreated up this uh, cliff over here. So this ice has all this liquid water underneath it, and as the basin's filling up, it's just keeping that, it's just lifting that cap of ice up underneath it. And so as I advance forward, keep your eyes, look for this. You can see this snow field right here. So this is, this was taken about a week before the 2011 outburst flood. And then this photo was taken right immediately after the outburst flood. So there's that same thing of snow from almost the same location. And so it gives you a sense of how much deflation there was when the, the basin drained out. And you can also see all the grounded icebergs and things like that. So if I go back here, you can see it's really, it's almost uphill from going onto the main glacier to go into the basin. And then after it drains out, it really drops off so that you're walking really downhill into the basin. So there's a lot of water holding capacity in, in that basin. And again, as we lose that ice in there that isn't being replenished, we're gonna be able to hold more water in that basin. Okay, here's another shot of pre-drainage, and this is kind of, and Jason has some other pictures of this as well. You can see some of the liquid water along the sides here. So there's water around the edges of it, but the main basin itself, it's not like a lake that we can just look at and see how high it is because it's covered with this uh, little sheet of ice. Okay, here's a few other shots. So there's grounded icebergs after the lake drained out. Uh, in 2011, and this is kind of cool because you can see the bathtub ring where the drainage was along here, and you can see all these icebergs that are stuck up on the cliff here from when the lake was actually up there, and this is probably, I don't know, somewhere around 150 feet. That was just my guess from walking around out there. And so there's the potential to hold a lot of water, and actually I, I calculated, I'll show you in a little while here, it was a lot of water in there. All right, and so here's a nice aerial view. And again, the, the sort of deflation associated with this, you can actually see cracking and settling all the way out onto the main glacier. And we landed right here in a helicopter, and this was right after the peak when the water was pretty much mostly drained out and uh, it was still settling. I mean, there was cracking and the ice was moving, and so you could still see all of this stuff sort of readjusting. But if you walk from here on the main glacier, down into the basin, it's really downhill as opposed to being sort of an uphill uh, slope when the thing is full of water. One other thing that's interesting to notice here is this lateral, mor lateral moraine. So the main Mendenhall Glacier is going down slope this way, and you can see that because it's down into the basin, the Mendenhall is actually, there's some ice kind of sloughing off down into this basin and sort of filling some of the edge of the basin, but a lot of this ice in the back over time will just waste away since it's not being replenished. Okay, a few more flood shots from last year. For those of you who missed it, there's the, uh, the road back by the campground there. Uh, someone along the Mendenhall River whose yard is going down the river right here being washed away and eroded, and this yard was really being eroded away. The house is on View Drive. So the, you know, the lake level that we got to last year was kind of just where people really started to worry and call for the sandbags and things like that. We got right to that level, and then this is right about when it turned around. So you know, people got water in their garage. We got some roads that were flooded, but it really didn't do a lot of damage. To put this in some context, if we look at uh, this, so this is a chart of the highest 
stream flow of the year, so it's in cubic feet per second. So what was the peak stream flow of the year for every year since 1966 when the stream gauge on Mendenhall River started? And so we can see this 2011, that was the outburst flood, 16,400. And that is the highest number that you'll see on all these peak flows right here. So essentially, we equaled the highest peak flow, but that's not to say like this 14,400 was, if anyone remembers, August 17th, 2009, it rained four inches downtown. So it's not to say that we can't have large floods just from rain events here, but certainly the outburst floods have the potential to equal or exceed anything that we've seen in terms of flooding on the Mendenhall River, at least for the period of record uh, that we have. Okay, so People always tell you in public talks not to show too many graphs, but I'm gonna show a bunch of graphs here and hopefully you can bear with me. So just for context, this is kind of setting the stage. This is the stream flow or discharge in cubic feet per second on the y-axis. Here's date, so this is this summer on Mendenhall River. These yellow triangles here show you the average stream flow on that date. So for 60 years, what was the average flow? And what the stream flow in Mendenhall River really looks like is a plot of temperature, right? It's snow and glacier ice melting. It's cold in May, it gets warmer. The peak air temperatures and melt are here in July and August, and then it's gonna start going downhill. So we're almost to present here, and it's gonna start going down. Well, what we can tell from looking at this graph is we had a pretty crummy summer, right? Because <laughs> the, uh, and it's not like I had to show you a graph for you to know that, but uh, here, so here, the, you know, the flows are below normal, below the baseline, almost all summer, except for all these rain peaks that we see. And this one peak here, this is the outburst flood. And you can see a pretty pronounced difference in the shape between, here's a rain flood right here, and the outburst flood, which particularly on the descending limb has this really sharp drainage feature. And that's again, even with putting a lake in the middle of the system, which makes it a lot less kind of pronounced than it would be. So what we can say about this summer is that it was colder and wetter than normal and we were really, in general, had low stream flows. And if you look at what stream flow was, and again, this is a log scale, right? So that's 1,000, that's 2,000. We were way below normal stream flow right before that outburst flood occurred, okay? And that's a good thing because the chance that we would be above normal stream flow and we'd put this outburst flood on top of another rain event, you know, then we're really going to be able to increase the potential for flooding. Okay, so we kind of want to spend time, most of the rest of the talk, sort of thinking about this outburst flood in particular, the one from 2012, what happened, what have we done to monitor it so far, and then what can we do uh, from this point forward. All right, so the first question on July 4th, which is when someone noticed that there's an outburst flood, and with the monitoring we have now, the way someone noticed is someone at the Weather Service was watching the discharge in Mendenhall. It started going up, and then, which it goes up all the time, right? If it's hot, the glacier melts, it goes up. If it's raining, the stream flow goes up. They looked at it and they said, it's kind of going up too much. And then if you look at some of the other streams around where the stream flow and they're not going up at the same time, some of the other glacier rivers, then that's an indication that you're probably having an outburst flood. So I got a call on the third and they said, oh, I think we're having an outburst flood event. So the first thing everyone wants to know is, well, how big is this gonna be compared to last year? Does Tom Matisse need to get his sandbags out and stuff like that? So I sat down and I said, all right, I'm gonna figure out a way to see how big this flood will be. Now, kind of as background, one thing that we did know is looking at the basin, the water level in the basin was not as high this year when the flood event occurred earlier as it was last year. So that was a good place to start, but at the same time, you could take less water and have a sharper peak and get to a higher uh, flow. All right, so here I sat down at my computer and I made a graph and I said, I'm gonna plot last year's, the beginning of last year's flood and the beginning of this year's flood on the same graph, I'm gonna see how they compare, and that will allow me to predict what the trajectory of the flood will be. Now, the ability to do this is predicated on knowing when the flood started in both years, okay? And so I went here and I said, well, the stream flow started going up there in 2011, here in 2012. I plotted these together and I looked at that and I said, oh my God. 2012, basically I was thinking that everyone in the Mendenhall Valley was gonna be like this, or like carrying their TVs on their heads, and so, 
I thought it was kind of a gloom and doom scenario. Now, thankfully, I actually didn't send this to anyone before I looked at it more carefully, and I'll show you why. Because when I went back and looked at the record for 2011, there was actually a big rain event, and so it started going up, and then it actually plateaued and then went down a little bit, and then the outburst flood started here, which I didn't know, but I figured that out once I kind of looked through the record really carefully. And so essentially, to compare the two events, what I had to do is take the blue curve and slide it back in time that way, because this red curve is plotted on 2012 time, which is what it is, but the blue one, I'm just trying to figure out where do the starting points match up with you know, taking my best guess. So when I slid it back, the two curves look like this, which looks a lot more reasonable, right? And then you could say everyone in Mendenhall Valley could just feel like <laughs> having a cup of coffee and watering their lawn, a much more sort of copacetic scenario. Okay, so, so basically at this point I said, well, that's my best guess that I matched the starting points up, and then I just kept updating this graph over time. So here we're into July 4th and July 5th. So now we jump ahead past that guy watering his lawn to July 5th and the people at the Empire called and they said, you know, do you have a graph or something we could publish? And no one ever wants to publish a graph of stream flow on the front page of the paper. So I said, okay, I'll definitely make a graph for that. So this was, I was just adding to the graph. And now when I looked at this, I thought, well, because I know there's less water in there and the trajectory is different, my guess is that it's probably going to turn around somewhere in the eight to 10,000 CFS range. The weather service was predicting around 12,000. The surface water guy from USGS in Anchorage was predicting 14,000. I have no idea how he came up with that. But it made me very nervous that my prediction was somehow flawed. And my prediction, again, you could just slide the red curve back and forth and you could change what the trajectory looked like. So, I sent this in an email. I found the email at 7.46 p.m. on July 5th to the Empire, to Mark Miller, and I said, okay, here's the graph. And I went home, and all evening I was like, oh my God, I wonder if it's gonna be bigger than that. And I kept sliding the graph back and forth. So I called Mark Miller at 11.30 p.m., and I was like, can I send you a new graph? I wanna like move it back a little just to cover myself. He didn't answer the phone, thankfully. <laughs> so if, if Mark's here, thank you for not answering your phone. And so my wife was like, what are you doing right now? We need to go to bed, you know? So I kept watching, and I remember very well at 12.45, because it updates every 15 minutes, at 12.45, at 1 a.m., it turned over and went down. And then I said, okay, I'm going to bed, because I knew that was the end of it. And in fact, it did turn around at 1 a.m. on July 6th, and that was the end of the flood. And so, you know, the trajectory was very similar, but again, it, we have to be careful because if we look at the amount of water that was released, so you know, just taking the area under the curve, assuming that this was you know, base flow, the glacier melt and everything, and that everything under the curve is added by the outburst flood, we got 9.6 billion gallons. I was trying to think of any unit that's accessible. Olympic swimming pools, I don't know if that helps anyone to visualize what 14,000 Olympic swimming pools look like, but it's a lot of water. So there's a lot of water in there in 2011, there's just over half the amount of water in 2012, okay? And we have no way to know this because we can't really see how much water's in the basin because of that ice covering in there. But we did know that there was less water in the basin. However, that's not to say that we couldn't take this curve and squeeze it and make the peak higher. So the shape doesn't necessarily have to be the same, although in this case, the trajectory of these two uh, turned out to be pretty similar. Okay, so where, where do we go from here? Well, basically, what we now have is at least a rudimentary monitoring program that we're developing, and the, the point of this monitoring program is to give us the ability to better predict both when the flood is, not predict when the flood is starting, but identify when the flood is starting by not waiting for the water to go under the glacier, through the lake, and down to the stream gauge, but to actually get data from the basin itself, where we can see when the drainage starts. And then also help us to kind of mark off how much the basin is full so that we have an idea of kind of potentially the relative magnitude and the trajectory of the flood. And then, you know, kind of a secondary goal, which is something that Jason's much more involved in and he'll talk about, is basically trying to understand, well, how does this system work? And that's something that's gonna be sort of a longer term effort.
Okay, well, I'm going to stop there and pass it off to Jason, and then I'll come back at the end if there are any questions. Okay, so as, as Aaron said, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the field activities that were going on up at Mendenhall Glacier this summer, and I'm going to break it into two parts. First, I'm going to talk about um, this monitoring program that Aaron mentioned, and, and second, I'll talk about uh, some of the more detailed studies that we've started on. I don't, I don't have a lot of data to present at this point because we just um, pulled all the instruments a month or so ago. I haven't had too much time to look at it. Um, but it, think of it as a teaser of what's to come in a, in a year or two. So the goals this year were to um, first identify what sort of instrumentation we can put up on the glacier to help us monitor the system. Um, figure out where to deploy them. Um, I think we accomplished those goals. I'll talk about that. Uh, we wanted to establish a baseline, so do some year-to-year -year comparisons of water levels up in the in Suicide Basin um, using photographic evidence and, and some of the data Aaron already presented. And then trying to establish an early warning system. And that's something we're working on. Uh, we had an undergrad, Jamie Pierce, that did a lot of work for us this summer uh, trying to get a system up. Um, it's mostly working. I'm confident it'll be working next summer. So just to give you a, uh, an idea of, of what we've been doing, we had a, a number of instruments out on the glacier at different times throughout the summer. Um, each of these little flags represents a seismometer. Uh, so that's just to record um, ice motion um, and maybe water flowing underneath the glacier. Uh, these, where do we go? These yellow push pins here, those are GPS receivers, which would show the glacier responding to water input. And then this star here is where we had a, a pressure sensor, uh, actually two, pressures, two different pressure sensors at different times, uh, and also a time-lapse camera, which didn't work as well as we'd hoped either. So this is a, a photo of the field site. Um, Suicide Basin is up in this corner. Uh, the West Glacier Trail kind of comes up and there's a nice lookout point in this area. Tempsco Landing Site, uh, their main camp is here. And so we had a number of seismometers and GPS in this area, uh, some instruments here, and then, uh, yeah, of course, a couple things up here in Suicide Basin. And, and this is just to show, to give you another view of Suicide Basin. Uh, the, there's a, a little lake right here on the, I guess this would be the south side, a little lake here that forms and, and is accessible uh, quite easily on foot, and then you can scramble up onto the rocks here on the side and, and put data loggers and things like that. So this is, the, this is the spot where we had a pressure sensor, a camera, and then there was a seismometer just a little bit farther up the hill. So first I'll show you just some photos of, of what Suicide Basin looked like this year. Uh, so this was um, taken in I guess this was about mid-June, mid to late June. Um, we were up there and put, this is when we put in the seismometer and we put in a pressure sensor. This was a, let's see, where did, where did that prop go? We just put in a little pressure sensor like this. Um, it's, we weren't able to uh, receive the data remotely, but we could go back up and download it and, and then that would give us information about what actually happened. So we had a little pressure sensor like that in the lake. Um, like I said, this is mid-June. This is almost the same vantage point uh, just a few weeks later. This was actually right after the flood. I went up there two or three days after the flood. Um, and you can see there's, there's no more water in this little lake. And maybe you could tell that the surface of the, of the basin is also depressed again, or deflated. And then this is now looking, I, I actually kind of crawled down into where that lake used to be and took a photo, and you can see there's a, um, a conduit right there where the water probably drained through. And uh, here there's, uh, these are actually icebergs. Uh, I, I don't remember quite how high they were, but they're uh, maybe 30 feet above um, what you, what, so when I was there in mid-June, the, there was the lake level. Um, came back a few weeks later and there were icebergs that were something like 30 feet above that lake level. So in a very short time, the water had risen up, de deposited these icebergs there, and then drained. That's 
Okay, so this plot then is showing uh, both the, the discharge curve from the Mendenhall River and also the lake level. Okay, so a few things to note um, is that the, the lake was filling at about four feet per day in, at the end of June, so I was quite surprised at how fast that lake filled up. Uh, July 2nd, uh, 1 a.m., the lake started to drain. And you can see it, when it first starts draining, it's, it's sort of slow, but then within, uh, what is that, a day or two, it starts to pick up and this, this, the slope of this curve becomes really steep. So the water starts to drain very rapidly. Uh, July 3rd at 2 p.m., that's when we start to notice the river rising, or that it, when you go back and look at the data, that's not actually when we first um, realized that a flood was occurring. And then uh, July 6th, uh, that's when the flood peaked, and this is, I guess that's when Aaron went to bed. Um, <laughs> so so what, what, what this shows us is that by having, da by having some instruments up at Suicide Basin, we, we have a bit of an advance warning. Um, we know that the flood started, we know what time it started, and we also have a couple days more notice to, to start preparing. It's also more time for Aaron to move his curves back and forth. So un unfortunately, we didn't have, at, at the time of the flood, we didn't have any instruments up there that were capable of telemetering data back into town. Um, shortly after that, we did go up there. Uh, this is Jamie Pierce uh, working on a, a new pressure sensor that has a radio link. Uh, so um, the data is going to be transferred back into town. These are just to give you some ideas of what we're working with. Uh, the data logger is, is way down here. The lake uh, that we installed the sensor in was um, somewhere in that area. And here's uh, Jamie scrambling up, trying to find a spot to put a radio antenna. So one of the problems we ran into is just that we, we don't have a good straight line view of town from, from uh, this location. So we have to climb up and then actually use a radio repeater to get the data back into town. That's looking down at the lake. Uh, we just ha have a, a pressure sensor will be hanging here. Just a couple more views uh, of, of the area. So the idea is that they, the uh, setup looks something like this. We've got a tripod with a, a data logger attached, a solar panel. There's a battery sitting here somewhere. The uh, pressure sensor sits down in this cavity, which was was filled with water earlier in the summer. I don't think it ever filled up again later in the summer this year. And then there's a way up the hill. There's a radio antenna, and then that transmits data across the glacier towards the North Star Camp. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the, the, the location of their camp. But it's basically just straight west from Suicide Basin, um, and it's it's easy for us to access because North Star is flying there throughout the summer. So this is then a radio repeater, which then sends data back to uh, our lab here. So that's, that's sort of where we're going with the monitoring. I um, feel pretty confident that the, the pressure sensor setup is the way to go. There's just some bugs we need to work out. Um, and hopefully, we can get it set up earlier this year. But we now have everything in place. And I think it, it should be pretty quick and easy to get it up next summer. One of the problems we ran into this year was that there was so much snow and it didn't melt, so traveling around on the glacier near Suicide Basin was a little bit treacherous. So that also delayed our start some. Okay, so th that's, that's sort of the immediate monitoring efforts. Um, at the same time, trying to think about you know, how, what, what is the potential impact of a flood from Suicide Basin. So, so trying to really understand the system, because there's several things that'll control uh, What's, how big the flood is. You know, one is how much water can Suicide Basin hold. Uh, second is how quickly does it drain through the lake, or through the, through the glacier and to the lake. Um, third will be how high is the water in the lake before the flood occurs, which is what Aaron was talking about. Um, so there's a few questions we're trying to answer. Uh, for example, how much water can Suicide Basin hold? Uh, what triggers an outburst flood? Um, la the, the flood in 2011 happened about the same time as a big rainfall event. So there was some speculation on maybe a, a, a big rainfall event will help trigger this. Um, this year, it, it, I, I think it was actually sort of nice that time of year. I, I was just coming back into town. I can't quite remember. Um, so yeah, so I said, how quickly is the water discharged? What are the water pathways? 
And so th the problem with, with these questions is that it's, they're really difficult things to observe. It's not like just going and putting a pressure sensor in a lake. It's really difficult to observe water flowing underneath a glacier. So we have to rely on indirect observations, such as uh, surface velocity measurements, which we'll uh, so tell you how the glacier is responding to the meltwater, which tells you something about the subglacial system. Uh, similarly, seismic measurements can tell you something about how fast the, the event is propagating through the glacier. So I'll just show you uh, what some of our instruments look like, and at the very end, I'll show you some really preliminary data that we got this last year. Uh, so again, these flags are seismometers. Some of them are located on bedrock. Some of them were put into shallow boreholes on the surface of the glacier. Uh, and then these yellow pins, again, were GPS receivers. So here we are installing one of the, uh, the systems. Um, it all fits into a pretty small, well, it, so, so underneath this orange bucket, we have the sensor itself that's recording the, the shaking of the earth. And it's connected to a, a data logger and a battery, uh, which we put into an action packer and then just strap a solar panel on top. So there we are installing one. Um, this is basically what it looks like at, when you're done with it. Um, pretty small thing. And then at the end of the summer, when we, pick, when we take it out, everything, you know, all the rocks get kind of dispersed. And uh, there's not really any evidence that we were there. Uh, here's a, a, a setting up another seismometer. This one is going into the ice, so we used a six-inch diameter ice auger. Um, this is the sensor itself, uh, the data logger box is in here. And just another shot. This is uh, about 12 or 14 feet long, this auger here. So that, that basically limited how deep we could put the instrument in. We would have liked to go deeper if we could, but um, we more auger parts and, and also it gets really difficult to clear the hole when you have such a long and heavy auger attached to your power head. And so just a shot of us lowering it in. Uh, these instruments are um, really rugged and waterproof and they can, um, this particular instrument as, as it rotates, it's, well, generally seismometers have to be quite level in order for them to work well. Uh, this one is fully gimbaled so it can rotate through 360 degrees and it, it, the instrument continuously resets itself. And just another shot, uh, here's the, one of the seismometers. Um, we came back and, and the ice the surface had lowered quite a bit. So now the, the instrument, which was originally sitting 10 feet down, is at the glacier surface. Uh, here's a GPS receiver. Actually, this amount of melting occurred in about a month and a half. That's one of the challenges of working on, a, on glaciers in this area is that the melt rates are so high. Any instrument you leave out on the ice will just topple over or melt out of a hole in a matter of a month or two. Here's another one uh, melting out. So like I said, just some uh, preliminary data. These are, this is the sort of data you get from a seismometer, just a bunch of wiggles and, and you have to squint at them to try and figure out what's going on. Um, this case, there was a lot of seismic activity that occurred right about the time of the peak discharge of the flood. So this is from July 6th and I'm showing, uh, this is about six hours of data. Um, two different stations, uh, and the point I just want to make here is there's a lot of activity. At this point, the, the basin itself is already drained of water. And so what I think we're seeing here is actually the, that, uh, that ice in Suicide Basin is collapsing. All the water has drained, the ice is now collapsing back. And that, that seems consistent with what Aaron observed last summer, 2011, when they were uh, up in Suicide Basin shortly after the, the outburst flood had occurred and heard all sorts of cracking. And so I think that's what we're recording here. I um, still have some work to do to interpret that. The other thing that occurred during the flood was that there was a calving event on July 5th. So the flood was already occurring. A, a pretty large calving event occurred. I think it might have been one of the largest ones of the summer that occurred during the flood. And we have, um, we have very good timing on that because there are cameras running at the, the Mendenhall Glacier Visitor Center with, we know what time the photos were taken. And I can compare that to the seismic data and I, I can see that there are, there's definitely seismic signals associated with a calving event at Mendenhall. So future work, uh, we're going to obviously continue doing these pressure se sensor measurements. Um, I think th there's definitely some things that need to be worked out, but the, the system uh, looks very promising. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to start using some high resolution satellite imagery to try and estimate ice flux into suicide basins. So the idea here is, is as that stagnant ice is, is melting it's in, in suicide basin, it's leaving a basin where water can fill up. But if ice from Mendenhall starts to fill that void, it, it, it might counteract the, the uh, melting of the stagnant ice. So we want to try to figure out what is the ice flux, what is the, 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 ice, the pattern of ice flow in the, the area of suicide basin. Um, I'd like to use some ground penetrating radar to, to determine what is the ice thickness in the, the basin geometry. So I don't have a, a ground penetrating radar. If anyone has one, I could borrow. I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you. And I'd be happy if you wanted to come with, too. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do analyzing the GPS and seismic data. It actually takes quite a bit of time just to process it before you can even look at the data. So the, the little bit I've shown here are just a couple of snapshots of the sort of things we can record. Um, I'm confident there's going to be a lot more information that comes out of this. It's just going to take a lot more um, squinting at these wiggles. Okay, and then finally, just wanted to acknowledge uh, a whole bunch of people. We had a lot of people helping out in the project and were interested in the project. Uh, so Tom Matisse at the city uh, and borough uh, helped out a lot, um, actually gave us a little bit of money to purchase instruments that are now going to be um, dedicated to Suicide Basin. When we first started this, we were using uh, instruments that we had pulled from different research projects, but now we have a set of instruments that are just dedicated to Suicide Basin. Um, National Weather Service, uh, Aaron Jacobs, Joel Curtis, Tom Ainsworth were uh, helping out. Um, we're really keeping track of the, the, the river gauge uh, at Mendenhall. North Star Trekking and Temsco gave us some logistics support and then a whole bunch of different field assistants and collaborators. Um, the seismology and GPS work I was doing with Jake Walter and Marcy Beitch from uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, both graduate students there. Uh, Jamie Pierce, uh, as I mentioned earlier, did a lot of the, uh, the work with the uh, pressure sensor and trying to radio link the data. Um, Jamie Bradshaw spent a fair bit of time with me up on the glacier putting out instruments. Um, a couple, Matt Cal and Jennifer Shin from UAS. Uh, Annie Bartholomew, UAF, a um, couple colleagues of mine from Chicago, colleagues from USGS, uh, Tim Parker at Pascal. Pascal is, is a uh, seismology, um, I'm not quite sure how you would explain them. They're, they're basically a facility that, that owns a whole lot of seismometers and they, and they loan them out to researchers. And, and Tim is really excited about trying to do sort of experimental seismology, trying new methods, and he's, he's pretty excited about the work we're doing on Mendenhall because it's, it's a glacier that's really accessible. It's, um, a lot of times when people are doing glacier seismology, they want to go to Antarctica, and um, it, it just it becomes a big deal to send instruments there and get them back. And, and here he can just send them up to me, and we can put them on Mendenhall you know, the next week. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that collaboration and, and what that might mean also in terms of monitoring um, Mendenhall Glacier and Suicide Basin. And then Matt Hevner, formerly of UAS, now at Los Alamos, has uh, been helping with the, the camera at the visitor center and uh, um, some weather stations and such in the area. So, thank you. Be happy to take any questions. Um, I guess if you have a question, uh, Rich Rochelle, who's, yeah, Rochelle is going to run around with the microphone. I have uh, two questions. I, I saw there that uh, suicide base, the suicide basin. Uh, gathered water at four feet a day on one of your charts? Yeah, that's right. It was. It well, was does that over the summer? I mean, that, that sounds like a horrendous amount. Is that a. Well, that was, that was over a period of two weeks. We didn't, that, it, was, it was when I first put the sensor in, I, th there was water there. I didn't, I didn't have any context. And then we came back and saw that in the next, over those like two or three weeks, it had risen at a rate of four feet per day. So it's maybe that's an abrupt event as well, huh? I mean, if it did that all summer, you'd have a pretty big lake. Yeah, no, that's true. You would have a really big lake. <laughs> well, and yeah, it goes yeah, to yeah. Like last summer, right? Because we had twice the water that came out, and so certainly it could have filled. Yeah, yeah. Filled a lot more than it did. 
And the other, the other question was, anybody know why they call it Suicide Basin? <laughs> I was, I've been wondering the same. But there's, I guess there are a lot of morbid glacier names or mountain names in the area. <laughs> Isn't there, there's Hades Valley or uh, Hades Highway, I guess, and there's Devil's Death Valley, Death Valley Devil's Paw, Devil's Thumb. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, <coughs> with uh, two years of data now, obviously they were so different, you know, one, uh, you know, twice the volume of water. So do you have any, um, any prospect of maybe figuring out uh, how to predict when it might, when it might uh, happen? Uh, and maybe is there, are there other places that have been monitored for a longer period of time where, where uh, you know, people have looked at it or that you could look at to get a, get a better idea of that? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's hard with two data points, <laughs> but um, there are there are definitely glaciers that have pretty regular outburst floods. Kennecott Glacier is a famous example um, that has. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what range of. It has an outburst flood every year, but I don't know if it's like always the first week in July or if it's sometime in July or or what. So I I don't know exactly how repeatable they are. Um, and there, there can be quite a bit of variability from one year to the next. And then the other thing is there, the, these, uh, Aaron showed the hydrographs from the, the outburst flood, and they, outburst floods, or hydrographs from outburst floods can look very different from one glacier to the other. That sometimes they can have a kind of a gradual rise and a steep drop, sometimes they'll have a steep rise and a gradual drop, and so it just depends a bit on the system itself. So it's, I think it's encouraging that out of the two data points, the curves look really similar. They're just stretched vertically. But, um, so one thing I want to do is to go back into the, the record and try to see if there are other, presumably smaller events from Mendenhall that look kind of the same. And maybe that would give us more info. Yeah, I, mean, I think the other thing we could look at is Tulsaqua. And if you look at the record there, which is pretty long, and Ed Neal at USGS has looked at it a lot, it's really variable. I mean, you can't, it's, the thing you know is that it's going to drain every year. Sometimes it drains once, sometimes it drains twice, sometimes you have two-thirds the water with a much higher peak. And so it's really, you know, it's predictably unpredictable, basically. And so it seems like we can predict that it will keep happening, but having a sense, I mean, I think now that we have some anchor points, we can look at the initial trajectory and the, the water level because we basically have a point surveyed in now. So if we put the pressure transducer in the same spot every year now, we'll know, well, how deep was it relative to starting this year and every year subsequent to this? And so with that anchor point of knowing the base, how full the basin is and the trajectory, that'll at least give us some reasonable ability to make a prediction that maybe I won't have to stay up all night stressing about. So. Right. Um, how far are we talking about from where the face of the glacier is to, to where the basin is at? And is the basin just a relatively, um, is it relatively new? I mean, how long has it been since it's formed and is it, is it caused by the melting? I mean, it, are we going to get a basin that's farther back as the glacier recedes more? Or will it completely open up to where that basin is at now? Uh, I should go back here. No, I mean, it's, it's what, probably six or eight kilometers up glacier on the east side there. I mean, it's, it's basically if you're looking at the glacier and you see Mount Bullard off to the right, if you went over it and down the backside, you're in Suicide Basin. So all the melt on the backside of Mount Bullard drains down into Suicide Basin. It's not, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty well contained because it's completely contained on three sides and the glacier is lifted up out of it. And so there's really nowhere for it to get bigger geographically it could potentially, if it loses more ice, get bigger in terms of its ability to hold water because it will have less ice in it over time. Although, as Jason mentioned, there's also ice slumping from Mendenhall in there. So that could, to some extent, counteract that. I'll just add one more complexity to it, which is that as Mendenhall gets thinner, it'll take less water for, the, for, for it to start floating. So as Mendenhall gets thinner, that, that basically means that even if all the ice in Suicide Basin goes away, it, would, it can't hold as much water before it would drain. So there's kind of a few competing things going on. So, uh, 
Suicide Basin's your main contributor to your scenario right now, aren't there any other basins in the area up there that contribute to this phenomenon? And also, as the ice disintegrates from the basin, there's going to be less pressure on the water, and the water will eventually be wide open to the sunlight, will warm up faster, maybe? Is that possible? Yeah, I mean, the water will be pretty cold just because it's in contact with the ice. And basically, I mean, in terms of it being pressurized, you're just, over time, going to convert what's ice into liquid water. And so in that way, it's sort of worse because you're holding more water that could drain out. And so, in, in other words, the ice is exerting pressure. But if you took away that ice and filled liquid water there, then you're getting the same sort of pressure on the glacier. Um, as, as far as other places, there. If, if you fly up Mendenhall in summer, there's a lot of small ice marginal lakes at places where side streams come down, but they're, the volume of them, they're not basins, they're just sort of small lakes on the side of the glacier, and so you'd never notice they drain and fill all the time, and you'd never notice it in the stream flow record. So that, that we can see there aren't any other large basins like that right now where you know a side glacier is pulled back, but that doesn't mean that at some point in the future there couldn't be you know, more basins like that. Yeah, and that's what Jason was saying, is we kind of have these competing things. It's like the dam is getting shorter over time, but we're getting the potential to hold more water, and so who knows sort of where that balance of, you know, where that competition will go. I mean, in theory, the fact that the dam is getting smaller is a good thing because it should be able to drain with less water pressure and then, you know, potentially refill if the drainage hole closes up. But again, it's really, I mean, if you look at the Tulsaqua, it's all over the map for know years and years of record with big floods one year small floods the next year and so there's no sort of predictable like oh over time it got smaller and smaller or something like that that's not typically you know I haven't looked at a lot of records but the one I have they're they're really unpredictable is there a channel that shows up regularly with the Tulsa Quaw that shows its drainage pattern since it's a pretty regular one. And would that be related to the, f the very different f outflow of water last year to this year with a giant waterfall that was invisible for so long and this year with nothing visible and everything slumping in the center of the glacier where presumably the water was flowing out? Yeah, I mean, I get, so you're talking about like a channel underneath the glacier that's in the fixed spot from one year to the next. Um, I, I guess that's one thing we're hoping we would be able to see with the seismometers that we could, if we, when you have a network of seismometers and you pick up some seismic signal, you can figure out, you can locate that event, figure out where it came from. And so hope, we're hoping that we could see a series of events moving down the glacier and that could tell us something about where that drainage system is. But we'd have to, we'd have to repeat the experiment, you know. That I don't know, and yeah, so the question was whether it's seen on the Tulsa Quaff, there's a channel there, and that's something I don't know, and I don't know, I don't think, I don't think there's really been a lot of research on the Tulsa Quaff other than observing like things at the surface, but observing the bed of the glacier is a really difficult thing, and it, usually you have to rely on things like um, some numerical modeling that to try and match observations at the surface, or you have to drill holes to the bottom of the glacier, and that gets really expensive. Two questions. Um, one is, are you able to, de de to determine the thickness of the ice on the um, in the basin? Um, I th I think with the ground penetrating radar, um, we do have what we'd call like a ice penetrating radar, which is a, just a different frequency. Um, it doesn't work well for really thin ice, and my guess is that the ice in, in Suicide Basin is pretty thin. So probably we need a type of instrument that I don't have right now. But we, what we could do is we could measure 
um, in the adjacent area, like in the, the middle of, of Mendenhall, and kind of work our way over, at least get an idea of what, what the bed might look like. And so that's something I'm planning to do next summer. And then I was wondering if you've given any thought to or um, have any interest in the, like the microclimatology of the basin in that area, where radiation balances and how that's contributing? Uh, I, I haven't thought about that, but that's a good question. Um, it definitely is like a little pocket there, I could imagine. It, mm -hmm. the, there's some, definitely some microclimate in there. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, we're going to put that station we're putting in, we'll have a weather station too, so at least we'll have some climate information. But really, I think the driver is the filling of the basin from like basically mostly external melting, although even when the glacier is kind of sloping down to the basin, you can see streams that are draining supraglacial surface streams that are draining off the main glacier and filling down into the basin as well. And that flow might reverse when, the, when it's inflated, but at least at the lower levels, which is more when I've been up there, there's water coming off the main glacier, off the suicide, and then off all the hillsides, and that's basically what's filling it up. Um, so, given what you know about Tulsa Qua and, you know, two years of data, understanding there's a lot of conjecture, do you have any sort of guesses on an upper limit and how bad can it get? I mean, we were, la last year it got pretty close to flooding some homes yeah. and um, obviously a lot of people kind of want to know how bad is it. <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's no way to say with tiers of data. What I would say is that we know that it can get at least as bad as it did last year. That's a starting point. <laughs> we also know that if you look at from that average discharge curve, in both of the last two years, we've been substantially below the average summertime flow. And so I would say a minimum worst case scenario is that you took it up to average flow and above that, you know, you had a rain event and you're coming down. And so instead of starting at a baseline of 2,000 CFS, you're starting at six or 7,000 CFS, and then you put the flood we had on top of it last year on top of that, and you're gonna get some substantial flooding. So I think, you know, that's kind of an easily, sort of an easy picture in terms of a worst case scenario, but I wouldn't wanna go you know, any farther than that. But I think it's, we've been really lucky in terms of having a low starting point in both of the last two years. You used the term a bit ago, external, external melting, and uh, you put in a caveat from rainfall events and so forth. Do you have any sense of the filling of Suicide Basin on how much of the water comes from actual glacial melt or from, or from the annual snowfall melt? You know, I, I don't know, but it, in a way it sort of doesn't matter. We know that it's filling up a lot. I mean, I think a lot of it's coming from where the glacier's pulled up and that glacier up above it that's thinning and melting. And so there's a big waterfall coming down into the basin. That's, that's the predominant source. There's obviously a little bit of ice melting within the basin itself. And then there's snow off the backside of Mount Bullard and some other hill slopes, as well as rain. So all those things are contributing. but. In the end, you know, we, we saw from the pressure transducer that it can fill up pretty rapidly, and thankfully this year it didn't have to fill up as much before it started draining out. So. How long it takes for the water to flush out? So from the time that it that it drains, it starts draining out of the basin. How long does it take to get all the way down? Uh, this year it was it was about four days. Well, it was four days from the time it started draining up at Suicide to the peak discharge. That was almost exactly four days, and then from the peak discharge back to normal flow. What was that? Another half day or day? Yeah. So something like four or five days for, for this year's flood. Yeah. Yeah. One thing we saw last year as well, we had a temperature sensor in the river down at Back Loop 
road. And so the water is substantially colder that's associated with that outburst flood. And because basically it, the volume relative to the lake volume is substantial, so it flushes the lake pretty quickly. And so we actually could see in the temperature record last year, a few days after the event had ended, that this huge pulse of cold water came through. So it takes a couple days, even with the volume that we had for the flood last year, for it to move through the whole system and come out the other side. So there's definitely a big lag associated with the lake. Do you consider the flooding a local phenomenon, or is it? Uh, yeah, do you link it to the climate change? <laughs> well, I, I don't. I I, th I think it's it is a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think what's happening here is is related to the fact that the the glacier is thinning and we have a, a, a this basin that has formed and and so there's regional warming that's causing Mendenhall to retreat and thin. Um, but there are also examples of outburst floods where you have advancing glaciers like the Hubbard Glacier, where it advances. Um, across to Gilbert Point, and what it does is it blocks off Russell Fjord from the ocean. And so then Russell Fjord fills up, and eventually there's a dam that breaks. So just like you can have a, a, um, outburst floods occurring when a glacier is retreating, you can also have them occurring during advance. It sounds like it, it, it drains somewhat gradually. I mean, do you, do, you, do you want to be hanging out in Suicide Basin when this is draining? Or is, it, is it somewhat cataclysmic? But, <laughs> I mean, from the pictures, it looked like, I don't know if I'd want to be there, you know? Yeah, well, I, th I think Jamie left. I think he was up there right when it was happening, right? Yeah, so. Actually, he was up there building the station that was supposed to monitor it. And then the next day, on July 3rd, then the next day, the call like oh my gosh it's draining and I said that's weird Jamie was up there yesterday he didn't tell me it was draining so I mean but if you saw the way it turned over at the beginning you know you're sitting there working next to the thing it's slowly going down you might not really notice and then you know once it really gets going I'm sure if you're there you'd see the water level dropping because once it turned over it was you know if it was filling at four feet a day it was definitely draining much faster than that once the kind of channel once you got that channelized flow but I don't think if you're hanging I mean you'll hear a lot of cracking and settling which is what we heard in 2011 up there it's a little disconcerting but you're sitting on the bedrock I think you'd be fine so and I, and I talked to someone um, that works for Temsco and she said she was up on at their camp uh, in 2011 when the outburst flood happened and they had no idea it was happening so they were just the water was probably flowing right underneath them the glacier was probably sped up by I don't know. Uh, usually when these sorts of floods happen, the glacier velocity can increase by like a factor of five or 10. And they, they had no idea. So. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't have <laughs> Not at this point. I Does think the water that, I think lift the Mendenhall and open up the network of drainage systems in the Mendenhall? I think that's probably what happens, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's been, that sort of phenomenon has been observed elsewhere. Um, I was hoping to have a GPS. I had a GPS kind of up by Suicide Basin that I was hoping to measure that, but I didn't get it deployed until after the outburst flood happened. So I missed that and was sort of hoping for a second one. but. Um, a small one. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, let's have a, a warm round of applause for our speakers. And thank you all for coming. Uh, don't forget, we have a wonderful presentation next Friday night right here at Egan Lecture Hall, 7 o'clock. So tell your friends. Thanks for coming.